Dr. Mori, Uncivilized Vitality. This is an Uncivilized Anatomy playlist video. We're going to do the uh, thorax or the, um, the upper part of your torso, superior portion of your torso that you would sometimes call the chest, and then the, the lower or middle third, I guess you call the abdomen, and then you get down to the pelvis. Those parts make your thorax. Let's talk about uh, briefly and quickly what your uh, thorax is. So your thorax is a cage of meat and bone that houses some of your vital organs, um, superior to the diaphragm, which is a flap muscle that closes off the lower part, we'll talk about that, uh, such as your heart and lungs. Very important uh, structures, that's why they're protected by an, a cage, a closed off cage of meat and bone called your thorax. So your thorax is going to uh, have an opening at the top that's going to be continuous with your neck. All right, this would be a neck, there's a guy smiling, little eyes, that's a neck, that's a terrible neck. But this is going to be your thoracic um, inlet or uh, better called the superior thoracic aperture or opening and it's going to be continuous with your neck and it's going to be closed off and it's going to be bounded in the back by thoracic vertebra number one and then you get thoracic vertebra number two three all the way down to 12 and then each of the thoracic vertebra is going to give off a rib and these ribs are going to continue around increasing in length all the way down to seven then they're going to get a little uh, a little shorter in length more cartilage and we'll talk about that and these ribs are going to come all the way around and form that sort of shape to the thorax all the way down. Then you'll get a couple more ribs at the bottom that don't reach around the front that float. And you can feel your own ribs and kind of feel your rib cages. They come around and they're going to move from the thoracic vertebra in the back. Each pair T1 through T12 has a set of ribs associated with it uh, corresponding numerically to the vertebra. T2 thoracic vertebra has T2 uh, right and left. Uh, costal elements which are the ribs and we'll do a little detail of those in a minute in the anterior in the anterior aspect of your thorax you're going to have a large bone called your sternum and your sternum is actually made of three parts all right it's going to have the manubrium the sternum proper and then a little part down here a little dangly bit called a, a xiphoid so your manubrium Right? Same root word as manus, meaning hand, because uh, to the Greeks it looked like a hand holding a little sword. And then the sternum is the, uh, the breast bone. And then the xiphoid process comes from the Greek, meaning xiphus or xiphus-like. Xyph uh, and a xiphus is a short stabbing sword, like a gladius that the Romans uh, used in the Colosseum to stab people. So you short short gladius uh, or Greek we call it a xiphus and that little dangly part there at the bottom looked like a xiphus so they called it a xiphoid process looked like a hand holding a sword weird but that's just what it is you can just refer to the whole thing as your breastbone or your sternum but those are the three distinct parts at the top you will find this supra at the top of manubrial notch sometimes referred to as the suprasternal notch which is technically incorrect or the uh, jugular notch uh, for other reasons, the jugular veins that we can uh, landmark just lateral to that, but supermanubrial notch, sternal notch, jugular notch, I'll take all of those. And you can find that by feeling along the top of your breastbone along where your clavicles come and you find that little notch. When the, uh, the ribs and the other elements come around, the other elements being your two clavicles that run from left to right and are part of your upper extremity, they tie into the manubrium. Just posterior to that, you'll find ribs one and two are going to attach to the, the manubrium. Ribs three, four, five, six, and seven are going to come around and directly attach via their costal cartilage, the little cartilaginous end of the ribs, to the sternum. Uh, nothing attaches to the xiphoid directly. And then ribs eight nine and ten are going to come around and attach to the cartilage of the rib superior to it so let's say i've got rib six that comes around and it attaches right to the sternum and i've got rib seven that comes around and attaches right to the sternum six seven rib eight will come around and it will attach to the cartilage of rib what is that Rib eight will come around and attach to the cartilage of rib seven. So indirectly attaching to the sternum. 
Rib nine will come around and attach to the cartilage of rib eight. Rib 10 will come around a little shorter and attach to the cartilage of rib nine. And you can see how this, this process goes up, giving you this sort of this opening here that's filled with, and you can feel that yourself, you feel your ribs, and you can see they do flare out and kind of run down on that shape. So what you're feeling as you walk out and they get wider up to that xiphoid, that curved little opening, is you're seeing these ribs attaching indirectly to the rib uh, above that. A little lower, you're gonna have two ribs that just sort of stick out that don't attach to anything, and they are said to uh, be the extra ribs, the uh, spare ribs, if we're talking about cannibalism, or usually we say the floating ribs uh, in humans because they sort of float on their own and they don't come quite around. And you can find the tip, the end of your floating rib and press in on it and give it a little bounce. You can see it's not attached to anything. And a good, uh, a good hook in the floating ribs is typically unpleasant. We'll talk about that in another video. This area here, uh, that is where those ribs come up, that kind of conical shape, just inferior to that xiphoid process, is sometimes called the solar plexus. Um, we get into that, it's related to the celiac neural plexus that's just on that superior mesenteric trunk, or the celiac trunk that comes off the anterior surface here, aorta. But mostly, it's called the epigastric fossa. Right? Epigastric fossa. It's just kind of right there. It's that little soft spot that hey, uh, people dislike being pushed, uh, pushed in. The ribs are also uh, categorized in a couple different ways. I talked about 11 and 12 being your floating ribs. The ribs that attach indirectly via their costal cartilage, uh, the anterior ends of the ribs, 10, 9, 8, are called false ribs. Those are your false ribs. And then ribs one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, which articulate directly with the sternum or the manubrial sternal body, portion of the body, are called the true ribs. All the ribs are basically the same and they kind of look like this. One would be slightly atypical rib just because of its shape. But each rib has a little rib head all right, with a couple of facets that's gonna articulate with the body of the vertebra. And then you've got the neck of the rib, and then the rib's gonna come out and start to turn. And at that part, it's called the costal angle, all right, costal angle, where it starts to turn and run to the front. All right, that's your costal angle. And you've got a little knob in here called the costal uh, tubercle. And then um, there, there's a couple other things. There's a costal, um, a uh, transverse costal facet on the rear of the, the posterior aspect of the rib where it's going to articulate with, see if I can do this in relief. So I'd have the uh, body of a vertebra here, like a uh, thoracic vertebra, and then posterior to this are the pedicles and such poking out, and then you've got a transverse process that sticks out from that vertebra that's going to articulate with the rib over here. Now that's not... Um, quite as accurate as it could be. Let's, let's do it a little better. All right, so you've got your, your tubercle, your neck, and then you've got the head of your rib with a couple little facets. And those facets are gonna articulate, there's a little crest in there with a intervertebral disc, and then the lower demi facet of a thoracic vertebra, and the superior demi facet of the lower, the, the next in line thoracic vertebra. So this would be, and then the, the transverse process is gonna come out and articulate with that rib as kind of a supporting strut, and then there'd be another rib up here. So they would work their way down. And the rib, uh, these are synovial joints. So you've got articulations with the vertebra above, the vertebra below, a little bit with the intervertebral disc, and then the transverse costal uh, articulation out here, you've got one, two, three, four synovial joints at each rib. Uh, not quite each rib, but we'll you know, talk about that more in uh, some clinically relevant videos. But each of those synovial joints is innervated, has blood supply, and can cause pain if it gets caught or slips or gets stretched. And each time you breathe and you take in air to ventilate and increase the capacity of your thorax, which is a closed off cage of meat and bone like we talked about, each of those joints is going to move and they're susceptible to uh, um, sprains and strains just like any other joint. Um, 
We talk a lot about, especially as a, a chiropractic uh, physician, I talk about ribs uh, being out or patients will learn what it feels like when a rib head is out. When one of these rib heads or a costal transverse element has subluxed or slipped a little bit or pinched a bit of synovium, it can be quite, uh, quite painful. So the rib's going to run around. The, the cross section of a rib, if I were to take a cut through that, your rib actually looks kind of like this and there's a little, a little groove in the inferior uh, inferior innermost portion that's called the subcostal groove and in that subcostal groove you'll find stacked up a vein an artery and a nerve uh, intercostal vein intercostal arteries intercostal nerves and we'll talk about those the intercostal nerves uh, are going to be intercostal nerves through one through six and then you've got thoraco uh, abdominal nerves and then at t12 you've got one um, subcostal nerve Intercostal nerves, thoracoabdominal nerves, and thoracocromial nerves. Thoraco, thoracoabdominal nerves. Holy smokes. So uh, those nerves are going to run around. And then in between the, uh, they're going to run between the innermost intercostals, the internal intercostals, and then there's another layer of muscle called the external intercostal. And those are going to form those delicious layers of muscle, um, not in a human, delicious layer of muscle in a beef or a pork that you eat when you eat ribs. When you take a section of ribs and that meat that you eat, those are the intercostal, between the ribs, intercostal muscles. And sometimes you'll find uh, veins, arteries, and nerves in there. But, uh, and then of course there's connective tissue layers like the pleura and the so-called silver skin when you're, you're uh, cleaning another animal to eat. And those ribs run around the uh, forming the cage of intercostal muscles and the costal elements and the vertebral uh, bodies in the back, T1 through T12, the sternum and manubrium, a little xiphoid in the front. And then the, the superior thoracic aperture is capped by your neck. So it's a continuation of the meat and muscle that goes up uh, your neck, which for, forms um, or serves conduit purposes for air and food and such and blood to and from the, the brain and nerves to and from the brain and the face spinal cord and the external or inferior uh, sorry external the thoracic outlet or the inferior uh, thoracic aperture is going to be domed over by a, a, a thin muscle that has um, a unique I'll figure out how to draw it a unique um, structure that's called the diaphragm it's a thin muscle kind of runs up with these two arms off the back of the back of your abdominal cavity these two cruce and then it fans out and you got a right and a left cruise that run off the vertebra and the muscle fibers fan up and out away from what's called the central tendon and they attach all along the outlet of your thorax or the inferior thoracic aperture. They come all the way around and seal that off. Now there are going to be some holes uh, or openings in this uh, membranous muscle, the diaphragm, which is going to as it pulls from the right and left cruise along that central tendon, it's domed. So here's your thorax from the side, right? Here's all your ribs. And then your diaphragm is going to close that in, typically like that. And it goes along these cruise and it comes up and closes it in. When the diaphragm contracts, it's going to flatten out as opposed to dome up. So it follows this pattern when you breathe in. My diaphragm is flattening down, and I don't know if we can catch this. My diaphragm is flattening down. It pushes my organs forward, and then back. I look a little pregnant there. You don't have to exaggerate that. Uh, but the diaphragm is going to rise and fall through contraction and relaxation all day, and it's closed off almost completely. There are a few uh, hiatus in these. There's an esophageal and an, or, uh, uh, an aortic and a uh, caval hiatus for your esophagus, your aorta, and your uh, inferior vena cava to pass through. And there's a small other, a uh, few others where nerves are gonna pass through there and such. But it basically closes off your abdomen from your thorax. And the diaphragm, when it contracts and flattens out, it will increase the volume of your thorax. When the volume goes up, the pressure, internal thoracic pressure will go down. And if it is lower than the atmospheric pressure surrounding you, air will, um, go down its, its pressure gradient and be sucked into the thoracic cavity through the only opening you have, which are your two nostrils, and down into your trachea. 
Uh, you, you can access your trachea if, if the epiglottis is up through your mouth, but you shouldn't be a mouth breather. Your mouth is for eating and uh, biting things. It's not for breathing. It's a secondary or emergency breathing um, structure. Your nose is for breathing. It directs air all the way down back through the, uh, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx down to the laryngopharynx into your trachea and then down into your lungs. And it's, it's, it's pulled in there due pressure gradients when the diaphragm flattens out, increasing the volume of your thoracic cavity. When volume goes up, pressure goes down. The pressure, um, being air pressure, is gonna pull air in, and when you relax and the diaphragm goes back to its domed shape, covering that inferior thoracic aperture, pressure would increase, volume would, or sorry, volume would decrease, pressure would increase, and you would <sighs> exhale. When you inhale, it takes effort. Contract the diaphragm, raise the thorax, intercostal muscles, some of the accessory breathing muscles like your scalenes and traps and such especially big breaths, right? Fill that lungs when I relax. The thorax will collapse back to its resting shape, increasing that pressure and uh, letting the air out. And I ventilate like that. Um, the ventilation is accompanied by respiration, which is the, the exchange of gases. And then ventilation, respiration together are referred to as breathing. We'll talk about that in another video. Let's get on with shape of the thorax. So you've got all those ribs. You've got 12 ribs on each side. So you have 12 pair. That's uh, 24 ribs total. Don't uh, mix, miss that on a test because you didn't read the question. Each thoracic vertebra has a pair of ribs. Ribs one and two come off of T1 vertebral body uh, and the lower portion of the T1 vertebral body where T2 articulates with T1 and T2 and then T2 and T3 and then T4 and T5. And you move all the way down a pair of ribs on each side that come out uh, articulating with the transverse processes as a support element where they come around. And then they have a cartilaginous end that joins to that breastbone in the front. And this is going to uh, form that, that skeletal structure. And then you will have um, the intercostals between there in those three layers, the external intercostals, which run on an angle, same as the external abdominal obliques. We'll talk about those in another video. And then the internal intercostals that run on the same angle as the, the uh, internal abdominal obliques. And then you have a third innermost layer that runs almost vertically, almost analogous to the rectus abdominis, that muscle that fills the epigastric fossa and runs down to your pubic bone and has those little tendinous intersections that forms those little ripply uh, six pack thing that everybody gets excited about. And I, I probably talked about that in other videos. The rectus abdominis does this, brings my thorax closer to my pubic bone to increase intra-abdominal pressure to help you poop. Uh, so that rectus abdominis is mainly a pooping muscle uh, or a vomiting muscle or a sneezing or coughing muscle. Um, it's kind of gross really that everybody spends so much time defining and showing their super strong uh, poop muscle that attaches my thorax to my abdomen. Um, there's another question that comes up sometimes. Why we have this thoracic cage to protect our heart and lungs? How come we don't have um, bones in your abdomen? Very simple. Pregnancy. Mam uh, human mammals have to gestate uh, in the womb, which is lower, and you have to have a place for that baby to grow. If you had a bony element uh, to the abdomen, it would not, uh, not work. So that's your thorax. There's a couple other parts of the thorax, uh, intercostal nerves. So you have those nerves that run through there. Those are going to be the continuation of the ventral primary ramus of a spinal nerve. The dorsal primary ramus uh, is just gonna head around to the back and, and divide into um, uh, motor for the muscles of the back and uh, some cutaneous. The ventral primary ramus of T1 through 12, those are going to be, uh, with some exception, like T1, those are going to be such as the ventral primary ramus in the brachial plexus video where those rami continued and then converged and diverged, it ended up in the terminal nerves of the upper limb, and then we'll do lower limb as well, uh, such as the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. In the thorax, those nerves come out and just continue as the intercostal, um, thoraco, abdominal, and subcostal nerves. And they're gonna come out and supply the muscles to the, or supply the motor to the intercostal muscles. And about halfway out, you're gonna have a split off that ventral uh, primary ramus, which is now the intercostal nerve in that subcostal groove between the innermost and internal uh, intercostal muscles. And it's gonna split and pierce through the intercostal muscles and the, uh, say, the serratus 
and the lateral wall here, and it's going to and then it spreads out, and it's going to provide you the the lateral cutaneous nerve. So when you you're feeling or getting tickled here, and you're feeling that touch your skin. That's a branch off that intercostal nerve that pierces through and becomes the lateral cutaneous nerve. And then the end uh, of the nerve, the ventral most or um, anterior most end of that uh, intercostal nerve will pierce through the skin and become the anterior uh, cutaneous nerves of the thorax and uh, later the abdomen. And then there's just a few named nerves which we'll do in a, uh, another video. So that is the, the thoracic wall or that's your thorax. We're going to talk about the Compartments inside, you have two pleural spaces uh, where your lungs reside and they're surrounded by the pleura. We have a mediastinal space uh, in the center. We're going to talk about uh, the, what's in there. Uh, surprise, it's your heart. And then uh, we'll go into neck and we'll go down to abdomen to continue the, the thorax. We have other videos that already covered the, uh, the vertebra. Hopefully by the time we get all these videos done, I think we've done about 40 or 50 of them now. It'd probably be 100 or so in the end. And then if you watch all 100 videos in the anatomy list, you'll get a rough idea of the, the basic anatomy, how you're put together. And then we can uh, go from there. You can pass a, uh, you know, a basic to upper level anatomy course with these videos, but use them more as review and not as uh, a substitute for a more uh, in-depth, uh, in-person lecture. What else? Uh, oh, uh, in the, 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 the female uh, of the species, the humans, there are functioning mammary glands or the breasts. We'll do a separate video on those uh, because they are part of the thoracic wall. And in the cadaver lab, typically we just remove the breasts and set those to the side, uh, preserve those for later when we get to uh, organs, um, thoracic viscera like heart, lungs, and uh, breast. We'll do those all at the same time. So uh, that's it. Like, subscribe, leave some comments below. Um, any questions and maybe I can, I can get back to you on those and uh, that's it like share subscribe